Okay, um, wonderful that you've all come out in, the, in the, the residue of winter, in the darkness and in the rain, um, to hear a talk called Spectres of June. And um, I look forward to some uh, tricky, exciting questions at the end. Um, and if, uh, if the uh, presentation gets a little too wordy, a little too much, um, Please enjoy um, Villeneuve's um, beautiful cinematography from um, his recent 2021 um, film presentation of June, which I think is an, a really brilliant representation of the novel. Uh, it's Baron, Baron Harkon in there. Um, okay, so this is called Spectres of Moses in June. And what I'm going to try and do in this presentation is show how the biblical archive impacts film, such, films such as June. Um, and uh, my final question to you, which is an important one, um, in what way does the biblical archive save our planet from destruction um, or lead it to destruction? So I guess that's my overarching question. My lungs taste the air of time, blown past falling sands, Frank Herbert, Dune. The memories of Frank Herbert's novel, Dune, Surface, so you want it higher? Okay. <laughs> um, surface as ghosts in the discourse of popular culture. Like shifting sands, these spectral shades haunt the present like elemental echoes. They come to us as if one with air, timeless and of another age. What Herbert might refer to as the air of time blown past falling sands. The figures of Paul Atreides, son and prophet, his mother, the Lady Jessica, witch, the Fremen, the indigenous people of the desert, and above all, the towering animalistic magnificence of the sandworms of the planet Dune are iconic and hint to um, more ancient times. These representations replicate and transfer as fragments and parts, tropes and vignettes, images, symbols, as the poignant narrative beats that breathe through the discursive space of contemporary <coughs> literature and film. Scenes like the test of the Gomjabar, the sacrificial lives and deaths of Duncan Idaho, the machine, the economic machine of empire, the water of life, the dream of terraformation are all reconceived and replicated anew in popular culture, notably in Star Wars, and Star Trek, for example, but even appearing ubiquitously in the Game of Thrones and in um, mem memoirs like um, World of Warcraft have all benefited from Frank um, Herbert's um, um, epic. Herbert's Dune did not come into the world ex nihilo, though. The memories of reverend mothers of literature past seep through and inform the lines of Frank Herbert's own masterpiece. These are such as Tolkien's oeuvre and the other antique voices of mythology such as Homer and Ovid, which are pervasive and endlessly speak into contemporary literary discourses. And then of course there's the Bible. There are even more ancient ghosts in every line, some as old as civilization. Thus Dune constitute, constitutes itself within a milieu of authorization, issuing from among other things, the archival power of the Bible, appealing to it through an, a myriad of interlinking echoes that speak to the sacred. Frank Herbert intuitively draws on the archival phen phenomenon of the sacred and the anointing of words and images with religious power. So tonight we encounter the biblical archive in Dune, referring to both Herbert's original novels, but also Villeneuve's um, film, to trace this entanglement of religious significations and what they might mean for um, his planet and ours. The archival afterlife of the Hebrew Bible is religious memory, particularly Torah, imprints or impresses itself on popular culture explicitly and implicitly in the myth of the first man, the fall, the establishment of Israel, the character of Moses and his messianic role in the liberation of a people. These are the ancient stories that write themselves into fiction anew, time and time again. 
For read through the lens of the novel Dune, this does come with a dire warning about the possible ends of our planet. The ancient sands of the wilderness of Moses, as one of Dune's antecedents, could be said to intermingle with the Arrakis land desertscape in reading, whether they were intentionally invoked there by Herbert or not. We could see the books of Moses as an archive, providing not only a set of laws, but also a lexicon, um, a collation of ideas and meanings that haunt another text. One word or image calls to all the others that are present and yet not present at the same time, like a chain of signification. This is what happens to the reader of June as one encounters its resonance. The biblical archive in June is most clear in its constant epigraphs. Frank Herbert writes them at the beginning of almost every chapter, such as this one that invokes the image of Messiah. You see him there, Herbert writes, a man snared by destiny, a lonely figure with his light dimmed behind the glory of his sun. Still one must ask, what is the sun but an extension of the father? In Dune, the use of epigraph as a signing of the work touches it with a tone that appeals to this vestige of the sacred, a reminder of its rhythm, a part for a whole. There is a spectral quality in the epigraph, a ghost in the text of Dune that is and is not quite biblical in the sense of an appeal to what is imminent, transcendent, and omniscient. Villeneuve, director, engages in the same ploy with the epigraph spoken by a mysterious voice in a Sadoka tongue at the beginning of his realization of Dune. The voice chants, uh, I want to do it for you, but, <laughs> but I won't. But it's like a Gregorian chant, but it's, but it's so ominous and deep, uh, like a huge space, spacecraft landing on the earth or something. But what, it, the, what the voice says is, and this is important not only for Dune, for the film, but um, for this uh, presentation as well, dreams are messages from the deep. Chants the unintelligible voice clothed in religious fervor. From the outset, the film appeals to the otherworldly and uncanny, offering, from the, uh, offering the spectator the semblance of the voice of an angel. Commencement and commandment are markers of the first five books of the Bible, traditionally attributed to Moses. The first book of Moses commences in this way, with a scene of Genesis 1 set for the dramatic and the arcane. What arises is a cosmic story of shadowy beginnings that traverse the primeval imaginary and entangles itself anew in the reader's encounter with June. Still issuing its commands with power, let there be. However, it is a subtle work of repetition and return that captures the reader's soul in Dune. Like the Lady Jessica of Dune, we too are homesick for some originary planet, our beautiful green paradise of Caladan, which holds the memory of water as old as Eden, and Herbert plays deeply on this biblical nostalgia. The reader shares with Herbert an existential longing for this paradise, such that it is, as one French intellectual puts it, it's a compulsive, rep repetitive and nostalgic desire, an irrepressible desire to return to some kind of origin, a homesickness, a nostalgia for the return to the most archaic place of absolute commencement. Genesis begins with a biosphere that is all water, a great pure swathe of it that seems to stretch to the ends of the cosmos. This shadowy primal sea, a miasma of deep things. It is from this spectral deep that a division manifests in the waters, troughs between billows blown by an eternal and originary breath, an atmosphere lightly hovering. It is from this gouge in the amniotic sac of this first world that dry land is birthed, and as with an uncanny sense of deja vu that the first man finds himself drawn out from between sodden earthy thighs at what will be the meeting place of four rivers, the Pishon, the Gion, the Tigris and the Euphrates. These four rivers trace the sumptuous pristine landscape like silvered worms, the first man's earliest memory 
and thus humankind's is a lush paradise of sybaritic pleasures. And as the legend goes, due to one foolish misstep, this man will find himself thrown out into the wilderness to make his way as best he can in a fraught and merciless world. In the wilderness, he walks a tentative line between life and death. He shakes with fear over what is all about him, the dangerous animals and more dangerous others, other men. And not just this, but the endless working and toil of a reluctant, rocky land. And most especially to the gods, who seem to offer little more than symbolic foreclosure against the capricious existential absurdity of it all. This outcast is caught between the poles of hope and despair. The romance with the biblical archive for science fiction like June is one of passion and nostalgia. It works in the shadows relentlessly. The biblical archive is not passive, but opens itself up even as it recedes from view. It is a slippage of this faint yet inexorable connection that holds a contemporary text captive to its whispers. It is a compelling set of repetitive and nostalgic desires that draw the reader to the origins. Thus, in the reverie of the Arakeen cave in Dune, the young protagonist Paul dreams like Adam of wilderness and water. The cavern is womb-like, a hollow in the world. He sleeps and wakes like Adam in this primal miasma. These scenes are replete with primeval, even biblical signs that draw forth forgotten memories in the reader and character alike. The romance of water and wilderness stands in for this hunger. Paul fell asleep to a dream of the Arakin cavern. Silent people all around him, moving in the dim light of glow globes. It was solemn there and like a cathedral as he listened to a faint sound, the drip, drip, drip of water. Even while he remained in the dream, Paul knew he would remember it on awakening. He always remembered the dreams that were predictions. Paul Atreides is the son of Duke Leto I, ruler of the blue planet Caladan. He is educated from youth and readiness for the day that he will ascend to the ducal seat. His mother at the same time trains him quietly in the arcane mystical science of the Bene Gesserit. There is an existential sobriety to his life, the ominous and ubiquitous threat um, of the brutal Harkonnens broods over it all. Paul's birth is not a birth to aristocratic privilege per se, but one overshadowed by death, danger and destiny. As a family is given charge of the obscene wealth of the spice mines of the planet Dune, Paul must not pass only the one test, that of the Gom Jabbar, the painful Bene Gesserit test of his humanity, but a myriad more, the trials of the desert planet, the trial of the death of his father, the trial of the duel with Jamis, the Amtal rule, the separation and alienation from his mother and sister, the sand rider test on the worm, the, me me uh, the mediation of death and life and intergalactic jihad, the greater personal costs of the jihad of Muad'Dib and the terminal consequences of daring to assume godhood. These latter tests requiring the sacrifice of his own flesh and blood on the altar of power and at the end of his life, the price is his own. As the Princess Irulan writes of Paul Atreides, he was warrior and mystic, ogre and saint, the fox and the innocent, chivalrous, ruthless, less than a god, but more than a man. There is no measuring Muad'Dib's motives by ordinary standards. In the moment of his triumph, he saw the death prepared for him, yet he accepted the treachery. There is a special affect in Herbert's casting of a romantic and spiritual dimension between Paul Atreides and the planet he inherits after his father's assassination. This planet, the parched wilderness of Dune into which Paul is cast, is framed and accentuated by a foil of almost biblical dreams and visions of water. In the few intimate domestic scenes um, between Paul and his desert concubine, Kani, they talk of water and wilderness. Kani's name itself means desert spring and alludes to the prophetic paradise that they wish it to come.
She asks Paul time and time again, tell me about the waters of your birth world, Muad'Dib. The contrast that emerges between the wilderness and water is marked and deep in the caverns there lies a, sick, a sacred site where water encounters the sand, <coughs> water that is even separated out from the remains of human flesh. How strange it is that dreams such as these mediate one's relationship with one's planet. What are ours? Given the maternal association with water, it is serendipitous that most of, uh, much of the scene of the sacred pool of water in the Arakeen cavern is narrated through the eyes of the mother, Lady Jessica. Her first thoughts in the vignette constitute a night memory of Caledon. She remembers the waves of the great sea there, touched by moonlight. The first sighting of the pool in the Arakeen cavern, however, is through Paul's eyes. Paul saw an unruffled dark surface of water. It stretched away into the shadows, deep and black, the far wall only faintly visible. The deep pool in the Arakeen cavern is more than a water source. These waters represent the constitution of the bodies of the people. It is into these waters that the waters of the dead are poured out and purified, including that of the first man that Paul had ever killed, Jamis, a desert warrior that Paul kills in a duel to gain the right to take refuge with the indigenous freemen. Jamis's water all 33 litres, 7 and 33 seconds drachm of it are poured out there. At first, Paul finds the desert people's communal sanctification of the body's water repugnant. He doesn't want to accept the water that constitutes the corpse of Jamis. In order to resolve this conflict in his mind, he turns to religion. He dredges up a scrap of pre-conscious knowledge, a fragment of a sacred text, 467 Kalima of Dune's Orange Catholic Bible, which says, from water does all life begin. The saying is echoed back by Kani, who gives him a proverb from the sacred law of her own people. Thus it is spoken, it is written in the Shah Nama that water was the first of all things created. This is both a death and a birth scene in the depths of the cavern traced by vaguely Abrahamic creation myths. In this moment, Paul is separated from his mother, both literally and figuratively. With Jamis, Paul both dies and is reborn to another tribe. It is a mikvah or baptism of sorts that draws him through death from Cal Caladan, the world of his father Leto, struggling but alive again into the world of the freemen, Arrakis or Dune, an immersion in the living waters of their people and their relation to their desert world. Because of the death of Jamis, he now makes the journey not as a stranger but one of its tribe joined in a new way to the earth. His mother knows it and evokes the shadow of the angel of death when she says, when the spirit of spirits within him saw the needs of truth, that spirit withdrew and spared my son. Moses, who is a Quetzal's Hadarach in the biblical narrative also walks from the water of Akaladan into the wilderness in a journey that echoes that of Paul Atreides. Moses has an elemental relation to the terrestrial ground of the desert, its ecosystem, and in this a ghostly resonance with Dune. Paul is a beautiful child, as recounted in the early chapters of Exodus. Like Paul, he's also a special child with a very special future. The ominous darkness of an Egyptian oppression represented by Pharaoh is on Moses from birth. Pharaoh of Egypt, who in June might be the figure of the barren Harkonnen. Moses is cast upon the water of the Nile before he is three months old. But rather than sink below its surface, like the tragic drowning of so many other Hebrew babies, he floats in a little wicker ark to be taken from the river into the arms of a princess. Again, death and rebirth. The princess names his, him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. And so like Adam, the first man, he is raised in a garden by a river. Some scholars situate the legend of Moses within a greater series of hero cycles. The legend of Moses is connected to each of these other myths by a chain of significations, sharing enough common elements to be recognizable. 
These participate in complex ways with the originary hero myth. And amongst these figures are Sargon, Cyrus, Romulus, Oedipus, Paris, Telephos, Perseus, Heracles, Gilgamesh, Amphion, Zethos, and Paul Atreides, maybe even Superman. <laughs> in Dune, the elements of the Sargon birth legend are found in the birth legend of Moses. So like Moses, for example, Sargon um, incorporates the exposure myth as a necessary part of this hero's journey. The baby, the reed basket, the exposure to the river and the sky, the miraculous survival of the infant, the proxy who's fated to draw the baby out as if into a second birth and thus augurs for the infant a God-ordained and powerful destiny, the destiny of a king. These same features resonate with the legend of Paul Atreides, the boy abandoned, who having lost his father to murder and betrayal, is exposed to the wilderness of Arrakis, which will become for him a catalyst and a crucible. The sands of Arrakis carry him like a river to safety, protected from the elements in his impermeable still suit, a kind of rubber ark. This traumatic journey is the cost of becoming Messiah, Quetzal's Haderach. The exposure myth creates a critical rupture in the life of the hero, <coughs> one that catapults him forward in destiny, an experience of loss, of forgetting one's own thoughts, which must be plumbed in order to reach the depths of fantasy, fear, desire, terror, terror courage, the known yes, that is the fullness of the void, unsplit. Like Paul, Moses' special relation to the wilderness begins with a death. It is this killing that creates a second rupture for Moses. In the archetypal way that Paul kills Jamis in mortal combat, combat in Dune's wilderness, Moses kills the Egyptian. As Torah recounts, when Moses was a young man, he was sheltered by a princess from the humiliations of the Hebrews, their enslavement, injustices enacted against them. Yet in a curious piece of verse, young Moses sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and everything changes in that instant. Unlike Paul Atreides, who is often presented as vastly more self-contained, who knows who he is, Moses seems furtive and unsure. Is Moses Egyptian or Hebrew? He seems to remain on the outside of both communities. The following day, Moses remonstrates with two Hebrews that are fighting. He faces unequivocal rejection from them. They say, who made you a chief or ruler over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? With that, Moses flees to the wilderness, a wilderness that will either kill him or become his life. In the killing of Jamus, Paul Atreides suffers humiliation too. Yet it is the blood price of killing that throws Paul and Moses forward in the narrative. For Moses, the wilderness of Midian swallows him up like the sand that swallowed the Egyptian. For Paul, he becomes Paul Muad'Dib, warlord. And it is the beginnings of this uh, realization of those troubling visions of jihad and of torrents of blood. Moses in exile becomes associated with Midian and the holy places of the desert. It is a poignancy of the human life and death struggle against the harsh desert ecosystem, ecosystem that seems to proffer a kind of concentrate, consecration. In time, Moses joins himself to a daughter of the desert tribe, Zipporah, and she has their son Gershom, which means I've been a stranger in a foreign land. As Paul finds a fragile and liminal home amongst the Fremen, he joins his heart to Kani, just as Moses finds his own tenuous hearth with Zipporah. But these relationships, sadly, are mediated by the greater weight of destiny, and they are always already eclipsed by it. Kani will go on to lose her child, and later she loses her own life as she orbits on the outside of Paul's calling. Zipporah too will exclaim to Moses, truly, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. But is this um, during the sojourn in this desert with this nomadic desert people that Moses is gifted with God-like qualities. He comes to hear the voice of God. He can perform miracles. 
But for Moses, the wilderness near Horeb is also a place of epiphany and wonderment, where withered desert trees burst into fragrant flame, and where there are angels and gods that speak. The desert is a site where the divine seems concentrated, where the divine might be encountered and where the divine might seek out a prophet. The loneliness and harsh isolation of the desert is one where a certain redemption might be found from exile or the cost of exile might be brought back into balance. In Kabbalah, we are reminded this, that this archetypal Moses is the soul root of Israel. The life of Moses is the life of the Jewish people. Moses' life is that in which Torah is conceived and bestowed on the people for untold generations. His lips will move, and so will theirs, a totalizing and unifying force. Likewise, it all begins in the desert for Dunes Paul, the crucible of prophetic powers, precognition. It is the result of exposure not only to the expansive and merciless nature of the Arakeen wilderness, but also due to the hallucinatory nature of the spice that litters the parched earth like manna. The book of Jeremiah alludes to the wilderness's terrible nature as being full of pits and desiccation, droughts and darkness. The wilderness is an environment of existential and psychic significance. Into this wilderness, your carcasses shall fall, the Torah intones. For the generations of Hebrews who must walk this expanse, it becomes a quicksand ready to consume human bodies. In the desert, the people must contend with a great oblivion that threatens triumph over being. And it is the same for Moses and Paul. Yet the wilderness also offers the refugee the symbols of absolution and promise. For Paul Muad'Dib, during his first night in the Arakeen Desert, Breathing in the spice, time begins to fold in on itself. Paul begins to experience the stirrings of the Quitzat Hadarak, Messiah. The boy he was becomes now just a shadow, fallen away like a carcass into the nothingness. The man he is becoming is arising, radiating from the desert in all directions. I have another kind of sight, says Paul. I see another kind of terrain all the available paths. This metamorphosis in the desert is messianic, a kind of messianism that has at its core a savage will to unification. The gathering into itself of the one is never without violence. Paul Muad'Dib cannot become Messiah without meeting out death, and neither can Moses. For Moses, the cost of becoming gathered to the one God in the desert of Midian is the death of every firstborn child in Egypt, the loss of an entire generation of Hebrews in the desert, countless other deaths, such as the genocides committed as the promised land is taken. And for Paul Muad'Dib, the cost of becoming the one is even higher. He becomes a world killer, tainted by the utter destruction of nine planets. But the greatest of his losses a personal. My son is dead, Paul said. He felt emptied, a shell without emotions. Everything he touched brought grief and death. It was like a disease that could spread across the universe. He could feel the old man wisdom, the accumulation out of the experiences from countless possible lives. Something seemed to chuckle and rub its hands within him. And Paul thought, how little the universe knows about the nature of true cruelty. It could be said that as soon as there is the one, there is murder and wounding. Born by ourselves, others, our world, born by jihad, crusade, the religious war that is symbolic and political and planet destroying. Both Moses and Paul in these fictional worlds seek to institute a unified realm held tight by monotheistic religion. They must then, by definition, preserve it by suppressing and obliterating any dissent with militaristic might. This will to the one is instituted within the biblical archive, haunting our religious histories, victories, and threatening our ecological futures with its will to power. The call 
to remember the faith once delivered, codified in sacred text, draws the past into the future. At the same time, the archive orders itself in such a way that forgetting is also part of the endless cycle of remembering. Thus, the injustices committed in the name of the one are remembered and forgotten in an eternal cycle. It is a strange unity, the messianic impulse, which we have seen in the hands of armed men is full of a kind of jealous violence. This one also, a conflicted whole that cannot sustain itself because it's con constantly differing and deferring from itself. The religion of Moses and the religion of Muad'Dib share in their origins some kind of archival violence that must destroy the other and at the same time it destroys the land and in doing so destroys everything. The violence here is so deep in the skin that it is primal as water and wilderness. Aaron and all the Israelites saw that the skin of Moses' face was radiant and they shrank from coming near him. There are specters of Moses in Dune. This is a kind of haunting that leaves behind itself an archaic and violent trace in the pages. This, Im this impression is not a fossilized remain, but it is still living. Inasmuch as a cinder continues to glow from amidst the remains of the fire. The specters of Moses in Dune reveal something of the nature of the swarm of instituting forces layered up and teasing the edges of the contemporary text. These forces play upon that which is always already forgotten and always already being called back into memory. It is a vicarious, intuitive, pre-conscious recollection that powers itself on a fever of nostalgia. The maternal memory constituted in a fantasy of origins, paradise and pools, primal seas, drives this melancholy hunger. In June, this fantasy is caught up in the tantalizing possibility of terraformation. There is water deep in the desert, trapped in the rock, harnessed into basins by the freemen, accelerated by Muad'Dib through weather satellites and seeding. But sacrifice, the wilderness to the water, and Shai Hulud, the great worm, the maker of the spice, will die. The obscene pricelessness of this commodity in the known universe found only in the worm-ridden wilderness of Arrakis. You can have the green land with pools and rivers, or you can have the wilds and dunes and worm sign and lucrative spice. One must die, one must live. You, can have, you can't have water when wealth is the power that's drawn from desert riches. The desert in dune must stay, and the pools are limited to dreams. A prophetic note is sounded in Dune that the violence of monotheism that pervades Dune is itself complicit with and at the same time critical of the biblical archive. <coughs> this corollary of the archive continues to enact itself in our contemporary world in, array, in an array of planet-killing multiplicities. That is the destruction of the biosphere through the destabilizing of the atmosphere, climate change. As per Her Herbert's Dune, one might say that the precipice before us has appeared without us really knowing and civilization continues to run headlong into it. When religion and politics ride the same cart, when that cart is driven by a living holy man, nothing can stand in their path. Water and the wilderness play a significant role in the books of Moses and this mythology is replicated in Dune Water invokes primal memories of the Garden of Eden, whereas the wilderness in Torah is a crucible where God is encountered, covenants are made, and a people purified. The promise of terraformation in Dune offers a fantasy of a return to Eden, echoing the Bible's prophetic books. But can it be realized in our world as well? A kind of retro terraforming. And will the monotheistic religions like Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, like the religion led by Paul Muad'Dib, lead the terraforming of earth back from the brink or ensure its utter ruin? So um, my question is a question for you. 
What role do dreams, fantasies, fictions or imaginings play in our relationship to the planet? What role does our faith play?